On Friday he was crowned with thorns, and this day he has adorned his church with a crown of splendor. Today is the day of rejoicing in the resurrection. This day is the day of rejoicing for all who have gone to their rest in the hope of the resurrection. This day with the fragrance of this incense, the church and her children celebrate and sing hymns of glory saying, O Creator of life, you have saved us by your passion and have given us life by your resurrection. Now renew our image by your grace. Clothe our bodies with the power of the Spirit, so that we may shine in the robe of glory, and in its light to see you, the true Bridegroom. In your grace make us and all the faithful departed worthy of your heavenly kingdom, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. so that they might go and anoint him. And very early when the sun had risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And while they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back and it was very large. And upon entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe. And they were utterly amazed. But he said to them, Do not be astonished. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one. He has been raised, and he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you shall see him as he told you. And then they went out and they fled from the tomb, seized with trembling and bewilderment. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were so afraid. This is the truth, peace be with you. He preached years before that the kingdom of God is near at hand. The inauguration of the kingdom takes place through our Lord's resurrection. It is central to everything. And when we look at the kingdom, the kingdom is not something that we go to. It's not a place. It's not heaven. They have that aspect. The presence with our Lord after death, that existential transformation, 
That is the kingdom in its fullness, but the kingdom is not a place in that strict sense of a field with flowers and, and seeing, you know, people who have died before. That will happen, but not because it's a place that we go to. The kingdom is a revelation of the will of God. It's a re revelation of the presence of God. It's why in the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom that we use today, you will note at the Our Father that we talk about the kingdom to come and to strengthen us in our weakness. So it's a reality that's manifested. It is ultimately the manifestation of the Spirit, the revelation of the will of God in our lives, and the individual transformation that takes place of grace within the human spirit and the transformation of the human heart. But all these things take place because of our Lord's resurrection. So the resurrection is central, this notion of the conquest of death. And our Lord does more than just return from the dead. Lazarus, our Lord brought back from the dead. The young man at Naim, our Lord brought back from the dead. Lazarus was brought back from the dead. But these people all died again because they were brought back to life, but that's all. And life ends in death. When St. Paul says in this letter to the Corinthians that the last of the enemies, the last of the obstacles to be overthrown and to be destroyed is death, He's talking about the resurrection on the last day, when all things will then be brought together, transformed, and placed within God the Father. And so St. Paul gives this cosmic vision of the end of the world to deal with a problem that's going on in Corinthia, in, in Corinth. Which is, as it says very clearly, how is it that some of you, in other words, how is it that some of you members of the parish of Corinth say there's no resurrection? Now, they're not standing there and adamantly saying there's no resurrection in the sense that they're just denying it explicitly because they're just being antagonistic. It's because they're being pagans in their thinking culturally. And the idea of after death you wing off to a happy place, that kind of an idea, that's a return of paganism that we have among us. This idea that somehow she's just better off now that she's died. Well, that may be true, and it may not be true. We don't know. But the vision of that, somehow that we just go, without the idea that resurrection is the very foundation of the whole reason for our faith. You know, if you go to Rome, you can sign up when you're in Rome for the scavi, the excavations that are underneath St. Peter's. It's something that you put your name in for, and then they will contact you at your hotel when they have a tour in English, and they will, you, hopefully you will be able to get into one of them. But as you go from the magnificent Basilica of Michelangelo and Bernini and all the rest of them, and you go down to the lower foundational level of the basement, what now is a basement, which is actually the ground level of the old Constantinian Basilica from the 4th century, and you have an altar from the 8th century, and the foundations from the 4th century, and then you go down lower into the excavations, and what you find is the place of Peter's tomb. But of course, he was just buried in the cemetery next to the stadium. In the Vatican Hill, Vatican Hill was just leveled. That's why you, you don't see a hill anymore. It was just leveled and burying all the tombs. They punched holes through the ceilings of the of these monuments, and then they just buried it, and then they built on top. But when you go down there, there is one very famous mausoleum for a family. And it's clear that you have both pagans and Christians in this family. Because the inscriptions and the words that are used in Latin are different, written over the names of the family members. That's one thing that's clear. The Christian bodies have been reposed here. In other words, it's something temporary. The pagans in this family's mausoleum are deposited here. They're just placed here. They're here for good. That's it. The other thing that you also notice is those are cubbyholes because they've burned the bodies of the pagans and put them in to those little depositories. On the other side, where you have the Christians being buried, you have the full space of the body which has been laid to rest, waiting for the day of the resurrection. We bring up these details continually because we have to make an effort to understand our faith and to live our faith contra mundum, 
against the flow of the way the world sees these things in the kind of residual form of Christianity that surrounds us. We await the resurrection. So what the Corinthians are doing, they're baptized, they're believers. When you say they deny the resurrection, doubtless some of them did deny the bodily resurrection. Because in their mind, the idea that this carcass, this clump of dirt, somehow will return, in the Greek understanding, was completely appalling. Now I've known individuals before their conversions as adults, for whom the idea of the resurrection of the dead was their greatest obstacle. Not praying to Mary or the saints or anything. No, the resurrection of the dead. How is this going to possibly be? How is this going to take place? And so what happens in our modern cultural norm of this residual form of Christianity that kind of lingers a bit like vapors and then gets mutilated by misunderstanding and misinterpretation, that's what the Corinthians are doing. The Corinthians are saying, Death is the moment we're done, that's it, the story's finished, now you fly off and you're happy with Jesus. And St. Paul says that is not the faith. The faith is that the dead will rise. And if you say that death has not been conquered, then Christ has not risen from the dead. And if Christ has not risen from the dead, then death has not been conquered, sin has not been conquered, and your faith is empty, it's a vain, it means nothing. Warm, nice, interior, tingly feelings have no use. They're empty. It's vain. And he says, we as the apostles, our preaching is also empty. Because our preaching is a witness to the resurrection from that too. And so if you come along with the idea that somehow that death is sign of the finishing and the end of the story, you have completely upended the whole and ultimately denied the gospel. That's what he's talking about in this chapter 15 to the Corinthians. The resurrection of the dead is absolutely essential. This is why we sat Shiva for seven days when someone died, and the whole aspect of mourning and the anointing of the body and the preparation of the dead and the insensations that are done at the home and at the church and the insensations of the body, all these things are done because they are only being reposed, because we wait for the resurrection. And so when we interpret life after death as just some kind of other happy place, this is a return of the Elysian fields of the pagans. This is a return of an idea. Our tomb should be very clear of the resurrection. Our tomb should be very clear, like the pagans in the very first century who understood this faith, the Christians among those pagan families, who understood the centrality of this reality of the resurrection. They reposed the bodies of their dead because they waited for another moment and another chapter in the whole event and the whole reality of human existence. And so when St. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he's saying, if you actually succumb to this idea that surrounds you among the pagan Greeks, you've made everything useless. And if in the end, the Christian faith is just about this life. He says that we are the most miserable men on earth because it means nothing. If the gospel is only about making us feel good on occasion throughout the year, that's not the gospel. That's all about me. And he says if that's the case, you're miserable. You're believing fairy tales. Just little stories of some Jewish rabbi at some point that you like. He says it's useless. He says, it's empty. You voided everything. And we are the most miserable of men, and the things that we believe are empty. This is a very strong thing that he writes in the letter. When we finish the sermon today, and we have the opening of the tomb, and we bring the cross around in its glory, it's important to understand that in our Syriac tradition, the cross is there on Good Friday, and the cross is there on Easter. The Latins don't do this. You come up and you kiss the cross, you venerate the cross, you make metony before the cross, because the cross in the Syriac tradition is living. The cross is victorious. The cross is life-giving. The Syriac fathers, when they write, they say that the cross entered with our Lord into the tomb. And on the day of the resurrection, the cross exited the tomb with our Lord in His glory. And again, what our Lord is doing is not returning from the dead, he is existentially transforming into glory the human nature.
that we participate in by our birth and that is consecrated by our faith and within the sacrament of baptism so that we enter into that mystery of the one who died and rose again, the living one, that we participate in that union with God, find the fulfillment of the kingdom of the outpouring of the Spirit and to be transformed in that union with God. And the body that dies is going to die. It's the valley of tears. Inevitably, death will come to each one of us. But it's not the end of the story. The body is prepared. The body is laid to rest. The body is treated with all respect because one day it will rise because the Lord Jesus is going to appear in glory. And when he appears, the living one, he says to us in the gospel that everyone on the earth will see the sign of the Son of Man. This is the cross, the living cross, the life-giving cross. This will be seen and he will manifest his life and his glory in that existential transformation. And that was what will cause the dead to rise. And those who have been conformed to that faith and to that expectation of that day of glory, they will rise in glory because they were united to our Lord during their lives. And those bodies will rise from the tomb and they will be, glor they will be united and glorified within our Lord. And the damned, those who were not united with our Lord during their lives, those who were not consciously living any kind of faith, those who just simply were indifferent to the realities of what God has accomplished in this world, they will rise also because life will transform everything in the cosmos. But they will rise in the mutilated form of their own souls, of that separation from God. And that is the resurrection of the dead, more the better to be say the resuscitation of the dead, because the life that they will live is worse than natural. It will be the manifestation of their indifferent, self-centered existences. This is what St. Paul is saying. And that our Lord, on the moment of that glory, when all the dead rise, that's when death, the final opposition, you see in this chapter, he talks about the powers, the authorities, the sovereignties. He's talking about both the human and the angelic elements that oppose the coming of the kingdom, that stand in opposition. And in the brightness of the glory of our Lord on that last day, which is the manifestation in its fullness of this day of His resurrection, those powers, both angelic and human, will be overturned. And the last of all the enemies of opposition to the kingdom and to the Spirit will be death. And that's why He says, in the end, the end comes, and the last of the enemies to be destroyed is death. The resurrection is completely central. You see, when I talk about residual Christianity in the modern world, we all go wild about Christmas. And that's nice. I mean, going wild is not great, but it's nice that we like Christmas. But Christmas is only the very beginning of the story. The story actually finds its fulfillment and its reality on the day of the resurrection. And that is central. This is the feast of feasts and the crown of all of the festivals of Christianity is the day of the resurrection. So you are very wise to be here. You are very intelligent to recognize what God has done in your lives. And when we live it with a response consciously day after day in a continual fidelity, then we are most wise. Because at that point, no matter what happens in our lives, whatever misunderstandings, whatever sicknesses, whatever illnesses, whatever pains or horrors that come into our life, which is inevitable in this valley of tears, they are all subordinated to the feet of the risen one, of the living one, the life-giving cross. All that story is already done. All we have to do is persevere, and in that perseverance await for the fulfillment of the resurrection for which God has brought us faithful because his son was struck as the rock was during the exodus and the movement into the promised land. And as the living waters came forth for those coming out of Egypt, so we receive the living waters that are the Spirit of God and the fulfillment of the kingdom that comes among us to strengthen us in our weakness so that we may persevere to that day of glory of the resurrection. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So please stand. The servers will be coming down the center aisle to light your hand candles because once we begin the procession, 
carry your candles and we will process around the church one full time and then come back down the center, much like we did on Good Friday. And then each person can come up then and bow, genuflect, make metani before the cross that the service will be holding. And then as you leave, they will be giving you one of the, one of the flowers that have been taken down for the moment from the tomb so that you can take them home with you. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Son of God, you are our Lord Jesus Christ, you saved us from the slavery of Satan. Grant peace and security to the church of the children of your holy church. We call out to you in prayer, O Lord, and hear us.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now I said, please all receive these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Hermas. Mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of the parish. Be mindful also, also of all those who share with us today in this offering. you 
our peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace, receive our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you are adored by all. Angels bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you. With purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God, the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, our minds and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming.
Rashada Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priest, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and with holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. the guardian and refuge of their lives, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious Saint Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name. We pray to you, Lord. Lord have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints. And in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. And bless, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with your helpful knowledge. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do you Give us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you. And join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit. Oh, and forever, as it was, is now, and shall be Yeah. 
merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy, that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your only Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el Kulchunna. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing of the Lord. Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts. Let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, so that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and holy Spirit, now and forever. Grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, that each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy God. Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo and Kulukunda. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the living cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your only Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen. 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 So it is beautiful to see you here today. So you're not only intelligent and wise, it is also beautiful to see you on this holy day. We remind you that the Maronite voice has come out this weekend, and so please take a copy on your way out the door. Once we finish the Mass here, we will return just a few moments after to do the blessings of the foods and the Paschal, the Paschal foods for this afternoon. So now you do it in Syriac. Mishiho komen kabro. Good. That was actually a very good time for the first one. Let's do it again. Mashio kom men kapro. Show yourself to be Easterners. Mashio kom men kapro. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.